A brake system's main function is to convert a car's kinetic energy into thermal energy. And it's also a safety item. A car's got to accelerate, decelerate, and churn. And deceleration is where brakes come into play. It's the biggest component of a car, in my opinion, because it has to do so much with safety. There's two different types of rotors. There's a one-piece rotor and a two-piece rotor. One-piece rotor doesn't have float, and it's just one big piece of great cast iron. Two-piece system is where you have a rotor ring and it's attached to an adapter hat. And the adapter hat's usually made out of aluminum and the ring's made out of you know, great cast iron. And uh, when you're talking about float, is actually the rotor is undergoing heat cycles. It's expanding and contracting, expanding and contracting. And that's where the term float came from, where uh, the rotor needs to be able to expand outwards and be able to contract without uh, binding the, the aluminum hat center. There's two types of float. There's radial and then there's axial. Back in plate. And the caliper, we'll just draw a big outline. The caliper. And we'll draw a pad on the other side. So when I'm talking about axial float, this is to the outside of the car, our outboard side. This is the inboard side of the car. Axial float is actually very important. It's probably the least understood type of floating that, that people and even brake companies don't understand is when uh, the rotor needs to be able to move back and forth freely inside its assembled state. And the reason why it needs to do that is because of uh, a phenomenon that happens inside the caliber called knockback. As the car is churning, the rotor, the hub assembly, everything on in the suspension is actually pretty malleable and it moves under force and under heavy loads, it actually moves ever so slightly. And so when the hub moves and the hub bearing and the whole hub assembly moves in the suspension, it moves the rotor and it kind of clocks it like this. This is an exaggerated type of outline of the rotor. So what that does is actually pushes back on the pad and pushes the piston back into the caliper. So let's just call this the piston. And so the next time you apply the brakes, you're gonna get a massive displaced pedal, or you're gonna feel like you don't have brakes and you have to pump it to get it back to where you actually feel brake pressure. And that's what axial float really helps with. Radial float's very important with uh, a two-piece system, and it's a very big performance gain because on a one-piece system, if I draw a rotor cross-section of a one-piece, it's all connected like this. And when the rotor wants to expand, when it gets hot, it'll actually want to cone. It's a phenomenon we call coning. And that's when the rotor tilts over into the pads and pushes the pistons back inside the caliper and the next brake apply, you have extra displacement. It doesn't build a lot of confidence going to the next corner when you don't have a pedal pressure, you know, for half the pedal travel. And so that's why radial and axial float is built into a, a two-piece rotor system. So it helps mitigate knockback and it allows the rotor to expand and contract freely. The main disadvantages to a, a drum brake system is that it's very bad at dissipating heat. All the friction, drum interaction, and stopping and heat building up is all captured inside the drum. And so it it's, may cost a little bit less, but it's less efficient at, as a braking system as a whole. A carbon ceramic and carbon-carbon rotor system works really well when you're generating really high temperatures. You'd see that in F1 or really high performance race series. However, 
for the street, it's not necessarily the best. You hear stories of people driving their Ferraris off canyons because they don't have enough heat in the system in order to stop their car. It really doesn't work that well in the rain and at lower temperatures, you just really have to mash the pedal in order to get the car to stop. And that's where duct iron has an advantage. It works well at lower temperatures and pretty much all temperatures. Uh, carbon ceramic in terms of temperature performance really works well at the very highest end of the temperature scale. Duct iron doesn't go that high, but those are some of the pluses and minuses of carbon versus iron. Drilled rotors mainly came about because it needed to dissipate the gas vapors that would happen inside of uh, the rotor and pad friction interface, where those gases would actually expand inside the holes and were allowed to escape. With the advent of newer pads and technology, that drilled rotor look and you know performance gain for escaping gases has kind of decreased. It's not really a benefit anymore. The main benefit for a drilled rotor is that it's just, it's gonna be a lighter weight rotor. A slotted rotor really helps with uh, initial bite. Um, it's what you actually feel when you first hit the brake pedal and slotting really helps with that initial bite that you and feedback that you really want when you uh, hit the brakes. A plain rotor has the most thermal capacity just because there's no slots, there's no drills and I would recommend slotting your rotors just because it's the best of both worlds. You get the initial bite, but you also get the thermal capacity still in there, and it's less prone to cracking and drilled. It really doesn't matter about the number of pistons in your caliper. It's all about the force output, and when you're talking about force output, it's just the amount of displacement or surface area of each piston. So you could have one really large piston or you could have 10 really small ones and it'll still put out the same force pushing the pads into the rotor. So a better way to answer this is what we would typically see is a four piston or a six piston. What's the main advantage is going to a six piston? A six piston usually allows for a larger pad. So you could fit a larger pad and you're able to get the force distribution correctly along a bigger longer pad with a six piston than a four piston caliper. Typically you want to have differential bores to mitigate pad taper. When I say differential bores, it's easy to see that the leading piston here is smaller than the middle and increases in size towards the trailing end of the caliper. Uh, even uh, pressure of the pad onto the rotor and that's how you mitigate pad taper with differential bores. We're able to mitigate pad taper with a two piston caliper and typically you would kind of think that you wouldn't be able to mitigate it because you know the pistons are going to be symmetrical but what we did was we made our calipers trailing and leading by adjusting the position of the piston inside the caliper and where the where it's pressing against the pad so the leading edge of the pad we move the piston center line away from it to help mitigate where the center of pressure on the pad is to mitigate that pad taper. So it's the leading edge of the pad is not digging into the rotor. It's actually more towards the middle section of the pad. Typically that's used in the context of a sliding caliper, what you would generally see on all the majority of the cars today. Um, it's a cheaper design that allows for the whole body of the caliper to slide back and forth. Um, you'd see that on solid axle cars or, or cars that have a one-piece rotor that, you know, that's how the caliper mitigates that knockback effect or coning effect from our one-piece rotor, is it's allowed to slide back and forth, forth or float to mitigate the knockback from a one-piece rotor. A fixed caliper is more prone to knockback, but at the same time you could uh, mitigate that by having a two-piece rotor. All depends on your car and how you know strong your wheel bearings are and your hub play is around the corner. So that's the main advantage of a floating caliper is that it's able to float on a one-piece rotor without having the knockback effect. Like a floating system is like less efficient in managing deflection and displacement in the pedal. On the other side, a uh, opposed piston caliper like this we're able to manage uh, deflection and force levels at a higher level. It, it's a lot stiffer 
and there's a lot less uh, compliance in the system and in the pedal and it's uh, better feedback for the driver as well. There's no best all-around pad. You can't have your cake and eat it too, where you have a race pad that works well on the track, but it doesn't exactly work well on the street. Conversely, you can't have like a good like street, normal, everyday pad that works well on the track. So there's pluses and minuses. And one of the misconceptions is if you need a really high friction pad in order to get you know better stopping distances, you're only going to be able to stop again as fast as their tires are going to let you and how well your brake brakes are actually balanced. Some of the benefits of high friction pads are that it works well in high temperatures and you're gonna be able to feel that initial bite that you kind of expect to get with a racing pad. You're gonna have that driver confidence that as soon as you hit that pedal, the brakes are engaged and that's some of the benefits for a higher friction. But at the same time, it's actually not gonna slow your car down any faster. It, again, it's limited by your tires and how well your tires are gripping to the road and the conditions of the road and the environment. One of the minuses of a high friction pad is that it doesn't work so well on the street. It only works well at higher temperatures and at lower temperatures it will tend to be noisy and it will be abrasive and it will actually eat into your rotor and you'll actually see more rotor wear than pad wear and that's the trade-off. There is no perfect pad. There's it, can't have your cake and eat it too. There's two types of pads. There's an inherent pad and an abrasive pad. Inherent pad uh, there's, means that the pads are actually getting consumed by the rotor. It's getting swept away by the rotor. On the other side, the abrasive pads are actually eating into the rotor. And you typically see that in the racing context. Typically, you would see abrasive pads used in a German car context where it's a Porsche, Mercedes, and they're on the Autobahn, they gotta be able to stop at high speeds and also in the wet, and that's where abrasive pads really work well. That means that the next time you go in to get your car service or for a brake check or you need to replace your brakes, you're gonna have to replace your rotor and your pad because the rotor is also getting consumed. Adherent pads you typically find on a Japanese or American car. You will typically see lower dust and lower noise and lower rotor wear with the, an adherent pad. Some of the benefits of an uh, adherent pad is uh, lower dust, lower noise, and lower rotor consumption. So those are some of the pluses of an adherent pad. To determine your car's brake balance, um, what you could actually do is go out on the street in a safe location and hit the brakes and figure out what axle locks up first. Uh, if you have the front axle locking up first, you know you could have a little bit more rear uh, bias to play with and bring it back to a balanced system. And if you have the rear locking up first, I recommend right away uh, remedying that by increasing the front bias. And one of the ways that you could do that was actually changing out the uh, brake pads is like one of the easiest way to change the, the bias set up in your car. Another misconception is that bigger brakes are better brakes, and that's not necessarily true. One of the most important factors for a braking system is to have balance. You gotta have the right front force output to go with the rear. A good way to visualize how these two forces need to interact is imagine yourself riding a bicycle. You have a front brake and your rear brake, and if you use too much front brake, you're gonna flip over. And the best way to get uh, the most optimum stopping distances is to use the front brake with the rear brake in synchronized fashion to get the best stopping distances. That's exactly how uh, brake systems are designed. With knowing that, the best system for a car is actually a balanced system, not necessarily a bigger system. Some people may think that stainless lines is kind of like a hoax or just kind of like a gimmick to put on your car and make it look like it's a race car. However, uh, there's plenty of evidence to back up that stainless steel lines displace way less than rubber lines. Um, it's one of the, my favorite recommendations to make to people is to upgrade their lines into stainless lines because you get instant feedback, your pedal feels way stronger, and the pedal travels way less and you have better modulation. It's such a cheap, easy modification due to your car to make an improvement.
with brake fluid, you have two choices between dot three or dot four. More, more of the race fluid or all the race fluid are, is going to be dot four, has a really high wet and dry boiling temperature. Uh, dry temperature boiling point, I, I remember it's around like 450 degrees F and uh, wet boiling temperature of like 360. So it's a really high temperature that you typically see in a racing car or vehicle like that. And a dot three, you're gonna find it to be cheaper, has longer shelf life, and it, you're never gonna get your fluid to boil in like a everyday driving context. But if, you know, if your pedal's starting to feel mushy, I recommend replacing your brake fluid, you know, at least once a year. And as soon as you feel like you boiled your brake line, so you bleed it or, you know, flush out your, uh, your system. There's no disadvantages really to buying a dot four. The only one is just, it's gonna cost you slightly more. Um, you're gonna have a higher boiling point, uh, you know, brake fluid in your car, and you know, you're just gonna have to pay a little bit more for that, you know, extra performance.